morning, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. I am Zuzana Tog. I am the research associate for, uh, for the Onoman Pashuta or the Gerald and Onoman Transact Rather. So we are going to take a long road trip now and we are going to go to one of the lesser metal and dial transacts in the Eastern Wabigan. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> this is my first slide. We would like to all thank uh, uh, thank all our collaborative partners from the government, the Geological Survey, uh, the Ontario Geological Survey, rather, Lorian Mineral Exploration, Greenstone Gold, and the academic partners, which are University of Toronto, University of Laval, and uh, Laurentian University. Is, are the slides moving? Because mine is not necessarily. Anyone? Can you We're see my outline, outline slide? slide right I got the outline slide. Okay, all right, perfect. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. I will begin with um, introducing the Gerald and Onoman transect that will be followed by the geological setting of the study area. After this, I will show our most important results that include structural geology, geochronology, and the mineralization styles. Then I will show you the geophysical sections along the transect. Uh, finally, I will finish up with the most important conclusions and the comparison of the Gerald and Onoman transect to the well endowed Abikibi Greenstone Belt. So the, uh, here down you can see uh, the map of the Superior Province, Superior Creighton. The red box highlights the location of, the, of, of, of this larger map. Mm, um, yeah, so this is the Wabigan sub-province. Uh, with the English River subprovince to the north and the Quetico subprovince to the south. The Wabigan subprovince is a grand greenstone dominated uh, subprovince, which is divided into three major terrains the Marmion, the Winnipeg River, and the Western Wabigan terrains, based on their distinct crustal evolution. The Winnipeg River terrain um, is dominated by Neo Archean rocks with Mesoarchean vestiges, whose evolution includes the river king of about up to 3.4 billion year old crust. The Marmion terrain down here is made up of a juvenile 3.0 billion year old crust, and whereas the Western Wabigan that is out here is dominated by 2.8, 2.7 billion year, year old Naldinian model ages, indicating juvenile oceanic crust origin. The crustal evolution of the Eastern Wabigun over here is unfortunately poorly understood, but it was suggested that the Winnipeg River and the Marmion terrains extend eastward into the Eastern Wabigun subprovince, but, uh, but the Eastern extent, their exact Eastern extent and their boundaries are yet to be determined. <clears throat> so this uh, slide shows the geological map and the stratigraphic column um, of the Geraldton Onoman area. The red line marks the location of the Geraldton Onoman transect, which is the seismic transect. Um, so this uh, transect starts in the south in the Quetico subprovince and then moves across the Beardmore Geraldton belt further north into the Onoman Tashuta Greenstone belt here. Mm. The Gerald and Onoman transect is one of the last metal and dial transects, but some mineralization is still present, as you can see on this map, that shows a large number of uh, base and precious metal showings. So we also have a few small past producing uh, mines in, in the Onoman touch the greenstone belt, but the Beardmore Geraldton belt is really the one where most of our gold showings are hosted, and uh, it actually already produced over 4 million ounces of gold historically, and it still has over 6.4 million ounces of gold in the hard rock deposit uh, only. So that's sort of 20 kilometer to the east of the map boundary here. Uh, the Onoman Tashta Greenstone Belt consists of two Mesoarchean um, and five Neoarchean uh, um, metavolcanic assemblages. And most of the, or all of the Neoarchean assemblages host base metal showings, and most of them host orogenic gold showings as well. The Onomantashta Greenstone Belt com contains multiple sedimentary assemblages that were deposited between 2715 to 2694. These are more extensive, um, 
and they make up most of the sedimentary packages within, within the Nomontashta greenstone belt, as well as in the Birmor Geraldton belt and to the south uh, in the Quetico. These, uh, these successions are broadly comparable to the porcupine sedimentary rocks in the Abitibi greenstone belt. So um, we also have a large number of intrusive rocks in the Eastern Mobile. They span in age from the Mesoarchean to the Neoarchean. They ages in the granitoid rocks of the Onomont Pluton, Nakina Gneiss complex, which is this one, range from 2920 to 2670. So include both the oldest Mesoarchean basement material, as well as the youngest granitoids known in the area. Um, within the greenstone belt itself, um, there are multiple phases of Neoarchaeans in volcanic intrusion spanning from 2780 through 2740 to 2720 over here. Um, and these are followed by a series of seen to late tectonic granitoid plutons between 2700 to 2680 million years. Um, so, okay, so the most important structures in the study area are the Quetico Fault, the Pain Lake Fault, the Humboldt Bay Deformation Zone and the Tashuta deformation zone. Uh, the Quetico Fault and the Pain Lake Fault mark the southern and the northern boundary of the Birmor Geraldton belt. And the Humboldt Bay deformation zone is, uh, is the one that marks the boundary between uh, two roughly uh, synchronous metavolcanic assemblages. They have different geochemical character though. Uh, and the Tashta deformation zone uh, is like a north-south striking deformation zone, which, um, which marks the boundary between the Mesoarchean and Neoarchean metavolcanic assemblages. So this is, now we are going to look at the new results that we have. This is a long list of what we've already achieved. I'm just gonna quickly go through because I won't have time to show you everything that we have done. So we have achieved, actually with Mike Hamilton's help, we have a new uranium lead age for the Jackson Pluton, which is one of the seen to late tectonic intrusions. We have a large data, database of uh, detrital zircon geochronology across most, most of those sedimentary units. We discovered a new Timiskaming aged coarse plastic sedimentary assemblage in the Wabigun. We finalized the structural history of the Onoman Tashuta greenstone belt and the uh, and, uh, you know, came up with uranium lead ages, age constraints for the deformation events. We also correlated the structural history of the Onomantashita greenstone belt with that of the Birmor Geraldton belt. After that, we have looked at uh, the geophysical data that was provided to us by the geophysical team. Um, we reinterpreted the seismic section so that now it includes the, both the R1 and the R2 sections. We also, as, as you might remember from yesterday, Ada mentioned that we have some new empty data in the Geraldton area. This gave us a new 3D empty model that I will show a section from, and I will show you our interpretation of that section. Also, the students are hard at work. They have completed the assessment of the base metal and orogenic gold properties, or some of them anyways, in the Onomantashuta greenstone belt, and they assess the regional and contact metamorphic events and the relative timing with respect to the deformation events. So one of our most uh, important or exciting new results is the uranium age, lead, uranium lead age constraint for the deformation event. The uranium lead age constraint for the D1 deformation event uh, are established by an S1 foliated phosphor quartz porphyry and tonalite dikes in the Humboldt Bay and Tashuta deformation zones. Both of these dikes yield at 2699 million year crystallization ages, and therefore the maximum age of D1 deformation is 2699. Our lower photograph here shows an S1 foliate, S shows the S1 foliation highlighted by pillowed Mephi flows um, that is cross cut by the Jackson Pluton here, which itself isn't deformed by D1. The crystallization age um, of the Jackson Pluton is 2685 and therefore this defines the minimum age of D1 deformation. So here is the, <coughs> excuse me, fresh off the press, uh, brand new, newly discovered Timis coming aged conglomerate in, in the Wabigan here. It is actually located along the shore of Lake Nipigon. So it's a beautiful outcrop. It's quite a small, uh, quite a small unit, um, but it did yield uranium. Uh, so detrital zircon ages with the, the youngest significant population at 2671 million years. 
Um, so that means that this is the maximum age of the sedimentation, 2671. And therefore it is actually uh, basically identical in its age to, to that of the Timis coming assemblage of the ABTB. It's a polymictic conglomerate, as you can see, it has a wide variety of class as well. So the, this is a conglomerate that was deposited after 2671. It contains a strong flattening foliation, whose orientation is consistent with the composite S1, S2 foliation in the Humboldt Bay deformation zone. This foliation, uh, you know, like, uh, this foliation has uh, indication that it was deformed during a, a D3 dextral event. Mm, and uh, we know that this sedimentary unit postdates D1 because it is about 13 million years younger than the age of the intrusion that marks the minimum age of D1 deformation. Uh, based on all of these considerations, the maximum age of D2 deformation is about 2671 million years. Kolsho and others calculated metamorphic argon-argon ages from amphibolite about 15 years ago and suggested that this age, the 2667, is the, um, is, is the minimum age of D2 deformation. We are aware that these argon-argon ages uh, are questionable for Archean rocks, so we remain cautious in accepting these, uh, this age as a correct minimum age for D2. Okay, so um, there's a lot of information on this slide, but um, what I would like you to remember from it mainly is that the timing and the interpreted deformation events in the Onomantashta greenstone belt are consistent with that of the Birmor Geraton belt. Therefore, we conclude that both of the greenstone belts underwent the same three deformation events. These same three deformation events are north-south compression and then north-south compression with uh, sinistral transcurrent <coughs> movement in the beer merger atom belt, and then dextral shearing or transpression. Now, combining the deformation of these two greenstone beds gives us a better age constraint because the D1 deformation was constrained between 2694 to 2690 million years um, by myself during my PhD. Um, and so this is a narrower age constraint than what we got for the Nomontashota greenstone belt itself. So we did not have a, uh, any, basically any uh, age constraints from the Birmor geraton belt for the D2 deformation event, but we got a fairly good def, uh, age constraint from the Lamantashita greenstone belt. Okay, so this slide shows that shows the first vertical derivative of the aeromagnet, aeromagnetic map in the geraton onoman area on the right, and then the geological map on the left. So the magma beautifully highlights that the structural trend, although both the Birmor geraton belt and the Onomantashota greenstone belt underwent the same three deformation events, the structural trends differ between, the Onoma, between these two belts. So in the Onomantashota greenstone belt, the dominant fabric is S1. It is better preserved and uh, wraps around the granitic intrusions to the east and to the west as well. So you can see these sort of mag highs highlight the trajectory of S1 foliation. However, the Birmor geraton belt uh, was affected by accretion causing the development of these east striking metavolcanic and metasedimentary panels. And it was then subjected to intense deformation and acted as a deformation corridor during D2 and D3. And, and this resulted in the transposition of S1 fabric, which is now uh, much poorer preserved or not at all in often, oftentimes in the Birmo Geraton belt, but it is very beautifully preserved in the Onomantashota Greenstone belt. So what I'm going to show now over a couple of slides is Keaton Strongman's uh, data or his uh, interpretation of the metallogeny of the belt. The Onomantashota belt contains one small nickel copper PG showing that formed in association with a composite layer mafic intrusion but no comatiites are known in this area that would otherwise be the typical hosts of magmatic nickel copper PG deposits in the Abitibi greenstone belt. Um, there are also examples of unconventional hybrid or high sulfidation type VMS mineralization with advanced argillic alteration um, that was formed in bimodal volcanic rocks. 
the mineralization and the related uh, rhyolite, the mineralization related rhyolites themselves have F2 and lesser F1 geochemical characters, suggesting that they were formed by extension of thicker crustal sequences. Mm, in the ABTB greenstone belt, uh, these, the VMS deposits are typically associated with F2 and F3 rhyolites, which are characteristic of extensions of extensions in thin crust. So um, again, in the ABTB, there are thin volcanic intrusion related system hosting gold, silver, and copper mineralization. But Keaton interpreted, um, he found and interpreted some unconventional base metal mineralization with, with all of these elemental associations. These share similarities with both Archean and Phanerozoic intrusion related systems. And he interpreted them as intermediate sulfidation type epithermal like and porphyry like magmatic hydrothermal systems. So um, obviously the ABTB greenstone belt is best known or very well known about, it, about its thin tectonic orogenic gold deposits, um, which is also quite uh, important in the Birmore Geraton belt. However, in the Onomantashita greenstone belt, we mainly have showings with one important mineralization at the Ishkodai property at this point. The other ones are yet to be discovered. Um, so the structural control for the thin volcanic mineralization is suggested by the multitude of thin volcanic dikes cross-cutting one another in the southern part of the Onomantashita greenstone belt. Additionally, uh, there is the ancestral fault control for both the thin volcanic and um, thin tectonic mineralization styles is further supported by the spatial coincidence of the thin volcanic and thin tectonic mineral mineralization. All of these three photographs show orogenic style quartz carbonate veins cross-cutting magmatic hydrothermal mineralization and associated hydrothermal, hydrothermal alteration. So now we are going to move on to the geophysical data. This figure shows the lithological interpretation um, of the R1 seismic section. And this also takes into consideration the R2 section that you know, imaged the upper part of the crust. So this interpretation or the seismic section suggests that the boundary between the Mesoarchean uh, basement and the Neoarchean crust um, that is outlined in orange. So this lies between five to eight kilometer depth underneath the Eastern Wabigan subprovince, but the boundary between these, between the basement and the supracrustal rocks underlying the Quetico actually gets progressively deeper southward from about five kilometers to 14 kilometers. And this suggests that there is a progressively thicker sedimentary succession in the core of the Quetico. So the major structures uh, on, on this section, on these sections are highlighted in blue. Uh, the best pronounced structures are the ones underlying the Beardmore Geraton belt, uh, which is the transitional belt between the Quetico and the Eastern Wabigoon. These structures are mainly related to the accretion along the southern boundary of the eastern Wabigoon. There is other well-preserved uh, structures underlying the eastern Wabigoon, but the only one that is well exposed is the Humboldt Bay deformation zone that you can see here. Then we also have some shallowly, um, uh, some shallowly north dipping structures that could potentially be thrusts that formed during the same accretion event as, as these thrusts. Thrust. Also, finally, uh, please note that there is these shallowly south dipping reflections, reflectors underlying the Quetico, uh, which are interpreted as a series of proterozoic dikes associated with the Nipigon diabase complex. This slide shows the empty section overlying the seismic section with the interpretation and with the interpreted structures. Uh, we have low resistivity zones that are found at depth underlying the Quetico, as well as the northern part of the eastern Wabigon. I would like to point out the strong conductor channel ascending to the northern part of the Beermore Geraton belt, um, which coincides with the Brookbank gold deposit and other smaller gold showings. Um, there's another weaker anomaly, anomaly ascending to the southern sedimentary unit of the Beermore Geraton belt here. Um, this coincides with the hard rock mine, actually, just as I said, this is 6.4 million ounces of resources and reserves. Um, which is about 20 kilometers to the east. 
Um, so this anomaly gets stronger if we step outside of the seismic, of uh, the plane of the seismic transect, both east and to the west. It is important also to point out that this, uh, um, that, that the Goa mineralization in the northern and the southern part of the Weir Mojaratum belt appears to be channeled through different structures from potentially different fluid reservoirs. Also, please uh, um, note that this low resistivity zone intersects the D1 thrust that is consistent with the SIN uh, D2 gold mineralization at the heart of deposit. There's also finally a weak anomaly that rises to the surface expression of the Humboldt Bay deformation zone, as well as to the conglomerate assemblage here. These anomalies ultimately form one stronger low resistivity anomaly along the western expansion of the conglomerate assemblage, where it coincides with the Humboldt Bay deformation zone. And therefore this deformation zone also carries further, min further mineral potential. In conclusion, in comparison with the ABTB greenstone belt, the Geraldton area has thicker Mesorchian crust underlying the Neoarchean volcanic and sedimentary successions. It has F1 and F2 rhyolites, and it lacks comatiites, suggesting that there was already a thicker pre-existing crust when the extension occurred. The area hosts ma a major deformation zone with a small Timis coming age sedimentary succession uh, that suggest mineral potential. And this is also supported by the MT section that I was just showing you. The area also hosts unconventional VMS and magmatic hydrothermal systems and small orogenic gold showings in the Onomatashta greenstone belt and actually quite a lot of uh, orogenic gold um, showings and, and mines uh, about, up, making up to about 10 million ounces of gold. The deformation style, um, differs between the southern and the northern part of the area. The Onomantashita greenstone belt displays a dome and kill type architecture, whereas, whereas the Birmo Geratum belt is more of an accretionally, has a more of an accretionally style deformation. Um, the Geratum Onoman area is comparable to the Abitibi greenstone belt because, uh, because it's northern, uh, because the northern part of the, the area, the Onomatashta greenstone belt, is similar to the northern ABTB, and the Birmo Geraldton belt is a deformation corridor similar to similar to you know the southern ABTB with the Desert Porcupine and the Cadillac Larder Lake Falls, and they share multiple other similarities as well. So overall, the different geological evolution between these greenstone belts can be explained by the presence and absence of pre-existing pre Mesorchian crust and its interaction with melt and hydrothermal fluids during its Neoarchean volcanic and tectonic evolution. I would like to thank you for your attention, as well as everyone who collaborated and supported our project, including Mike Hamilton, Jeff Marsh, Eric Roots, Adamola Adetunji, Said Sharagi and Mustafa Nadijadeh. If you have any questions, Great. fire Thank away. You Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, Ross, this is Mark. Uh, uh, two questions. Do you think the Nakina tonalite nice could be an expression or a window of the Mesoic here in basement? Oh, I, I do absolutely think that, yes. I, at least parts of it. So as I said, it does have um, both the oldest and the youngest rocks um, of the Eastern Robigon from 2920 to 27, 2670, sorry. So I do think that there is old Mesorchian basement exposed there, but it's it's quite a collage of different granitoid rocks. And, uh, and I think it needs more work to better understand how these different units actually distri distributed in there. Great. Uh, my second question then is uh, the Jackson Pluton, that young one, seems to be floating on your section on top of the basement. How do you explain that? Hmm. That is a very good question. Is there a detachment? In, in here. Is there a detachment between the two, you think? Well, the this would, yes. Is there this a big decoma be between, the, yeah. Well, we don't know if this has any sort of structural importance, this, uh, yeah. um, this linearment, 
but uh, I do think that this is somehow, you know, sits on top of the Mesoarchean basement because actually this area is one of the best, um, best defined area of everything. The Mesoarchean basement exists. Yeah, um, I, I see. I see the comment that uh, they may not be imaged in the seismic data, but uh, I've seen a lot of plutons on lots of seismic lines in uh, in the Yilgarn, as an example, and many mm -hmm. of them show roots. Uh, I'm a bit intrigued by this one, not uh, necessarily showing very clear ones. Um, I could potentially imagine that it could come down somewhere in here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the section but, but is, is not, uh, maybe the section is parallel to the roots or something like that, yeah. Well, yes, and that, you're right, because in this part of the belt, uh, the section is roughly parallel to the axis of the greenstone belt itself. So yeah. we may be just outside of that plane here. Great, thank you. No problem. Are there any other uh, live questions? Susanna, you, you mentioned that uh, you did find a, a conglomerate with a Timiskaming age, a maximum age of 2671. Along that uh, deformation zone, is there any evidence of small scale um, alkaline intrusion? Mm, not yet. I haven't had a chance to look at all the geochemistry that we have yet. And uh, no, there was very little research done, especially in the intrusions in this area. So no, not yet. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of geochem that you know could potentially answer that question. Okay. Anything else? Okay, Zuzi, there's a number of questions here in the chat room and uh, sure. one here from Ben. Have you looked at the regional gravity along the sections to help potentially image some of the Mesoarchean basement? I, I don't have my gravity data yet. So the answer is no. Okay. 